Hey guys, welcome back to Introduction to Rust. My name is Tensor. This will be video eight in our series. Today we'll be talking about traits and generics. So we've kind of already touched on traits through uh, the define annotation as well as implementing debug. But traits are essentially a way for us to define uh, shared behavior over multiple different, I guess, uh, sets of data. Traits are very similar to interfaces in other languages. They allow us to define what a function should look like and then allow us to implement that function into various different uh, data types. So to create a trait, you just use the trait keyword and we're going to create one called shape. And this trait will have a single function inside of it. You see here that it takes a reference of self and returns a U32. And so we have here two structs. One's a rectangle and the other one's a circle. So this one has an X and a Y and this one has a radius. And so now we've implemented shape for a rectangle. And you see here we just created an area function that multiplies X times Y. And then we can implement it for a circle like this. And uh, of course, because we have to pass back a U32, we can cast the uh, result of multiplying the radius by itself and then by uh, pi as U32. We can simply instantiate our uh, structs here and then print out the areas like this. So you can see here that we got our results. Um, of course, this was converted to U32, so it stripped off the decimal points. And then this other one is just the multiplication of the two sides. So we also have the derive annotation that we can use to implement various different traits. The compiler is essentially capable of providing basic implementations for specific traits. So here we have two structs A and B. One has an I32 in it, and the other one has an F32 in it. We've seen before that you can write a derive annotation above. You can put the debug flag in, and this will allow us to print out an instantiation of A with a debug flag so that we can see it in the console. We also have the copy and clone trait. Clone is interesting because it gives us a little bit more control over how our variables work inside of our ownership system. So you'll see here that if I take A, and instantiate it here, and then I assign it to a variable C, we can't print it out after it gets assigned to C because it's been moved to C. So when we reference A now, it doesn't actually reference to this piece of data anymore. However, because we've annotated it with clone, we can actually use a method called clone to clone the variable. And now you'll see here that A still references this particular piece of data and C exists as well because it now references a clone of this data. Now if we want to uh, make it so that we don't have to reference clones specifically every single time we can use the copy trait here and this essentially says that every single time a function or a variable borrows our data it will automatically be copied. So this A struct gets instantiated as A and then we uh, move A to C. In this case, it copies it to C, and then we can print it out as we normally would. So we don't get an error here that says that it's been moved. So we also have multiple different comparison traits as well, and we're just going to take a look at them real quick. We have the EQ trait, and you can see here a trait for equality comparisons, which are equivalent relations. This means that, for example, A equals B, and B does not equal A, and so on and so forth. And then we have partial EQ, which is again, more comparison, and it adds more uh, information to our uh, data type here. And we can keep going. We also have uh, partial Lord. And partial Lord is, uh, it gives us asymmetry, transitivity, and uh, various other things. We also have Ord, which gives us asymmetry um, and transitive operations as well. So there are many uses for these comparison operators. I'm not going to go too much into depth on them right now. So we can also use traits to overload operators. So we can use our binary operators on these unit structs. So for example, if we wanted to implement uh, addition for A and B here so that they uh, give us A, B, and B and A respectively, we could do that. So let's take a look at that. For instance, in this case, we're implementing add for A, but we're saying, okay, we want to implement addition with respect to type B for A. And then we have to specify the actual output. So the output is going to be of type AB. And then we implement our add function here, which takes in self and then RHS. And we put this little underscore because we're not going to use RHS inside the function body. And then we say, okay, this will output an AB type. So our AB struct here. 
And then we also need to implement it if we want uh, the addition to work the other way around. We need to implement it from the other side as well. So we're going to implement uh, addition for B with respect to A. We put the output here as BA and then we implement the add function like we did up here. Now you can see here that I can add the two together. So rather than just instantiating each of them, I can just say A plus B and B plus A. Now we'll get some errors if I try to add like A and A or B and B because I didn't implement addition for A for A and for B for B. So it doesn't really, the compiler doesn't really know what to do with uh, two Bs like this. So it just kind of throws an error. Now, if we print this out, you can just see that we just get AB and then BA back. So yeah, this can be pretty useful when you want to overload the uh, basic operators inside of Rust. We also have another trait called drop. So here we go. I'm implementing drop for our struct A, and this is just a basic struct with one single field that's just a string. And what drop allows us to do is to specify when we want the compiler to actually drop the value from memory. Now the interesting thing about drop is that it automatically gets called when the variable gets dropped. So even if we don't explicitly use it, it will automatically get called. So for instance, with our A here, we have a string that just has A in it. B, we have a string with B in it. And then C, we have a string with C in it. And we have three different scopes here. So our innermost scope, C will get dropped when it hits this parenthesis then B will get dropped when it hits this parenthesis, and then A will get dropped when the program actually quits. And we can actually specify by calling drop on A here that we want to drop A before the program ends. So we'll drop A here, and then we'll have the program end. And you can see here, first it says leaving inner scope two, and then we get dropped C, and then leaving inner scope one, and then we get dropped B, and then it says program ending, and then we get dropped A. So basically, this runs first, then C gets dropped here, then this runs next, then B gets dropped here, and then A gets dropped here, even though this gets run first. And that's just simply because there's not much more to this program here. So we also have an iterator trait, which is used to implement iterators over collections like arrays and stuff. In this case, we're creating a struct called fib, and we're creating an iterator for this specific struct to basically print out a Fibonacci sequence. You can see here we've got two fields in this and we implement iterator for fib and then we have to specify the type of collection in this case u32 and then we have to implement the next function here which takes in a mutable reference to self and outputs an option of u32 in this case and then we uh, we implement basically this here which uh, will essentially create a Fibonacci sequence. So we also get various methods that we can use on our uh, iterators. So here we have a take method. This says, okay, we want to take the first 10 elements of our iterator, and then we want to do this with them. So in this case, we're just printing them out. We're iterating through them, each one. So then we have our skip method here, which skips the first 14 of this collection. And then we take 10 afterwards. So Basically, we, we skip the first 14 values, then we take the first 10, and then we iterate through them and print them in here. We also have the next method, which allows us to iterate through our iterator one item at a time. Our first iteration through, we take the first 10 numbers, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So this is the first loop. Then the second loop skips 14 numbers and then takes 10, so from, from 987 all the way up to uh, 75,000 here. And then this is our, us calling the next method on it. And you can see here that it returns the option, so it doesn't unwrap it. We could use pattern matching to unwrap these to actually get the values out of them, or we could just use the unwrap method, but that's something that we'll talk about a bit later. All right, so now let's talk about generics. All right, so here's an example of a struct that uses a generic. So you see here that we have these angle brackets, and then we have this capital T inside of this. And then for the field here, for the type declaration, we're using this T again. Well, essentially what this is doing is it is allowing us to generalize the type declaration for this specific struct. So now if I instantiate this struct here, you can see here that I've instantiated it four times. In this one, I've used an integer. In this one, I've used a float. Then I've used a slice. And here I've used a character. And all of these are working perfectly fine. 
Generics are extremely useful for reducing code duplication, and you can kind of see that here. I mean, rather than having to write four different structs with four different type declarations, we just write one here. All right, so we can also use generics inside of functions. So you can see here that we've created a generic here, uh, T again, but we also have this other stuff, which we'll get to here in a moment. But so we've got this basic function that should be able to print out any type as long as it has the debug trait attached to it. So this here is shorthand for deriving the FMT debug trait for our generic T. So if you think about this, like if we pass in a, a non-primitive type that we can't debug, it will throw an error if we just like remove this part of it. You'll see here that this actually will come back and say that T does not have the debug trait. But if we put this little flag in here, then we're basically saying, okay, well, we can run this function on any value that does have the debug trait. And you can see that here by us running it on 10 and then running it on a string here. So we can use generics inside of implementation blocks here. And notice that we've written the uh, generic twice here. Now, the reason we do that is because this struct here is bound to this specific generic. So we're saying here, that a of t is the the implementation that we want to sp specifically go on and then here we're specifying another t so you have to remember that this t here is not the same as this t because this t is only scoped to this block here and the same goes for the t here so for instance if i remove this t here we'll get an error saying that this is not in the scope so we need to specify that we want to have a type here. So you can use any other capital letter, or capital whatever. So like I can make a generic type that looks like this and the compiler won't have an error. So even though this one says T here and this one says A, K, S, whatever, um, it still should work. We can see here that we can instantiate A and then we can just call A.item. And this will just return a reference to the field inside of A. Now we can also use uh, generics to sort of define patterns for our structs. So think about it like this. If you look at this struct, we have two different generic values and both fields are bound to do different generic values as well. So U and V are independent of one another in this case. So we could have like a float here and then a character here, or we could have two floats inside of here and it would still work. Whereas with struct B, we need to have two of the same type for both of the fields. So we can't have like a character for X and then like a string for Y, it just wouldn't work. So in a way, this is sort of like a, a abstract version of pattern matching. All right, so here's our shape trait that we implemented earlier, except this time it's using a generic T. And we've created an area here, which takes in a reference to self and outputs a T. Then we're creating a struct called rectangle, which has an X and a Y, which are both of value T. This implements the mol trait, which is multiplication. Then we have our implementation block, which implements the copy trait. And this is for shape T. So we're using the generic again, and we're implementing it for our rectangle T. And then we have this where statement, and we're saying that the output of our multiplication has to be of type T. So we're, we're basically saying that, okay, uh, our multiplication needs to be a consistent type with uh, the fields that we have inside of our struct here. When we uh, actually create the function here, we can still use generics like this, like we've specified inside of our trait here, and this will work. So you can see here that we have integers and we have uh, floats. Now, if we try to put characters in here, you'll see that we get an error because we can't multiply Z and C together. There are various ways that we can actually write this here. Instead of using this where block, which is much cleaner, we could write it all inside of this here. So you see here that I've put the output here and I have to open up another set of angle braces here and write output equals type T. And we also have to implement the multiplication trait as well. So what we're doing here is we're saying type T implements multiplication trait where the output equals T, and it also implements the copy trait. Now the reason we're using copy is because we're using a reference here. And then we're saying, okay, shape T for rectangle T, and then we just have our area here. This becomes a little bit more problematic when we try to use, like for instance, a circle. Here we're trying to implement our uh, generic trait for a circle. 
and this is working fine as it is right now. We'll have an error now though when we start to try to uh, work with a actual value here. So if we multiply 3.141 times our uh, radius here, the problem that we're having is that the compiler doesn't really know how to multiply this by uh, our type T because our type T is still general whereas this is a uh, float. So there's a fairly complex way that we can actually get into casting and we can use macros to fix all of this, but uh, we're not gonna go into that right now. Now it's important to note that when working with generics, the type parameters often must use traits as bounds to basically stipulate what functionality a type implements. If a trait uses the addition, then it requires T to be bound to the addition as well. That is T must implement addition. In this case, because we have T implementing multiplication, we can only use uh, types that implement multiplication on their own. So this allows us to bind say rectangle to be of type number. Anyway guys, that's all for now. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to comment and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment box below. And if you dislike this video, then by all means downvote it as much as you like. Have a good night.